I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the Publisher's Desk podcast. My name is Pierpaolo Finaldi, and I'm the CEO and publisher of the Catholic Truth Society, a publisher which has been serving the Catholic community in the UK and abroad for over 150 years. We've published everything from prayer cards to booklets to leather-bound liturgical volumes and everything in between, and have published great Catholic authors, including Cardinal Newman, Ronald Knox, G.K. Chesterton, and many others. Uh, today, I'm very happy to be speaking to another in our long line of distinguished authors, um, Father Armand de Malloray, author of one of our latest releases, uh, Meditations on the Stabat Mater. So Father Matt de Malloray was born in Anjou in France and ordained in 2001, and he's been ministering in the UK on and off ever since, and is currently the rector of the St. Mary's Shrine in Warrington in the Archdiocese of Liverpool. He's written numerous articles and most recently a book on the priesthood x-ray of the priest in a field hospital. So welcome, Father de Malloray. Thank you. Good. So um, first of all, um, can I ask you to give us a, a little summary of what the Stabat Mater is and how it's structured? Um, I mean, many people may have just come across it as a, as, as a hymn or something that they've sung and maybe haven't heard it really thought of it as a, as a whole. So um, can you give us a kind of a summary of what it's about and how it works? The Stabat Mater is, a, is an old uh, piece of poetry. It's a poem written, uh, as one assumes, by a Franciscan friar uh, called uh, Jacopane da Todi. He would have died in uh, 1306, so quite a while ago. And it describes the sufferings of uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary at the foot of the cross, where she stands by her beloved son, uh, nailed to the wood for our sins. So it's a, it's a meditation on compassion, really. It's uh, how the new Eve, our Blessed Lady, uh, teaches us through her own suffering and love um, to look at the Lord Jesus on the cross and uh, to allow for the redemption uh, he uh, you know, wrought for us to, to touch us, to benefit us, to save us. One of the things that you speak about um, very, very well in the introduction is a kind of structure which, uh, of the poem itself, which kind of moves us along um, uh, to, towards essentially a, a deeper relationship with, with the mysteries of salvation. Do you want to just say something about that um, threefold structure that you mentioned? Yes, there are um, you know, many strophe or stanza in the Stabat Mater, and really almost uh, uh, half of it is about um, us witnessing the event as if we were somehow external to it, as if we did not dare at that first stage to identify with anyone involved in the event because that's my interpretation. At that stage, we are still sort of blinded by sin, by our own guilt, responsibility, and so we can't really picture ourselves in in that uh, setting. Uh, so we see things, really the, uh, the the sufferings of Our Lady, as something external to us, as if we were almost, you know, uh, walking by. And then there is uh, a bit before half of of the text. Uh, um, then there's we enter a second part where we sort of take responsibility for, for her sufferings. And we start understanding that that beautiful, innocent woman who is there in tears, uh, looking at her son crucified, uh, is actually suffering on our behalf. We realize that this innocent man on the cross is actually dying not for his own sins, but for ours. And so we gradually become sort of emboldened in our uh, sort of uh, uh, connection with uh, the main actors in, in, that, in that scene. And uh, so we realize in that second part that um, we are the ones benefiting from all these sufferings. It's something about us. It's not just looking at uh, you know, the surprising, moving, and uh, tears of that beautiful, innocent woman, it's actually connecting to her as our mother. 
And so that's the second part is, uh, of course, essential because that is when we discover this new dimension, this filiation between us sinners and the new Eve, the one to whom our blessed Lord entrusted us uh, from, from the cross. When in the person of St. John, of course, he, he said, um, behold thy son uh, to Our Lady and to St. John, behold thy mother. And then in really the very end of the long poem in the last you know, two stanza, which is just the end, uh, like the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, um, then we dare and address our blessed Lord himself. And uh, although in, in duration, in size, is very little in the whole poem, in fact, it's obviously essential because that's the culmination. Uh, the Marian intercession is all about allowing us to connect again with Jesus. Our Lady has only one purpose, and it is not at all to draw attention to herself, obviously, but to facilitate uh, our communication uh, with our son, and in that context, be acknowledging that he's dying for our sins. My, my impression is that um, it is difficult for us who are engrossed in the world and in worldliness and often in sin, alas, to, to see ourselves as the one saved by Jesus. And that realization is more likely to occur if we are very gently, in a motherly way, introduced to that reality by, by such a, a, an innocent, beautiful woman, the Blessed Virgin Mary. So she takes us to Jesus, and in the end we realize that, and we are, we are humbled enough, but also confident enough uh, to, to admit to it, and therefore to be open to um, you know, the fruit of, of the redemption. Do we know what the kind of origins of the Stavat Mater were? What 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 it what was the purpose of its original composition? Because I mean, now it's become very much um, connected to the Stations of the Cross, but that that as a devotion comes kind of a bit later, I think, doesn't it? Um, yes, certainly. I mean, it seems to have developed in the context of the Franciscan, uh, you know, spirituality and and devotions. We know that the Franciscans had a very, if I may say, incarnate uh, approach to their faith. For instance, uh, to them is attributed the first crib, the actual depiction, let's say, with a clay in you know, the characters uh, of you know, the shepherds and our blessed lady and St. Joseph, uh, the nativity, which has now become really part and parcel of our, of our piety in every church or home. Uh, before Christmas, we have our crib. And, uh, and we still have it until, uh, you know, hopefully the, the 2nd of February. Um, so they did the same uh, with a less uh, sort of a happy stage in uh, the life of our Lord, and that is with the crucifixion. So they, they put, uh, you know, beautiful poetic words, uh, these, uh, these sufferings of Our Lady. These words are not, uh, apart from perhaps a couple of exceptions, taken for Holy Scriptures. Uh, it's invented, it is poetry. But indeed, soon enough, the church included it uh, in her official liturgy, and it's now, or has been for centuries, in fact, um, officially sung or read uh, at the, the feast, for instance, of the seven sorrows of our Blessed Lady on the 15th of, of September. So uh, it's a beautiful thing to be able to, to sing this and to the, therefore make ours the, at the time, private inspiration of a Franciscan friar. I would agree, uh, you mentioned the Station of the Cross, that it is certainly a beautiful uh, link from one station to the other, um, especially in a big church, uh, the one you know, we had the joy of uh, praying in here at St. Mary's in Warrington is, is, is pretty big. So uh, it takes a while for a group of people to walk from one station to the other. And that's a lovely thread that in between uh, two stations, we can say uh, one stands out to of the Stavat Mater, we are led really by the meditation of the Holy Mother from one stage of her son's suffering to the next. Yeah, indeed, that was that was going to be my next question, um, because um, as we said, most people will come into contact with the Stavat Mater in the context of the stations. And um, I think uh, it, it really adds another dimension to that devotion. Um, what, what would you say is, is what it really kind of brings to, to that devotion of the, the Stations of the Cross? 
what I personally like is that um, as the congregation will walk uh, from one station to the other, uh, they are the ones singing the Stabat Mater, uh, led by the priest, why not? But it's very much all of us as children of Our Lady who are making that acknowledgement that we are saved, of course, by our Lord, but through the motherly mediation of the Immaculate. And so that the crowd is speaking her uh, gratitude, uh, you know, tenderness and, and love to our Blessed Lady, making theirs her sufferings. Uh, it's also a nice way of, sort of punctuating uh, what would be a, a very harsh and, uh, and very painful meditation if it were always and without interruption on our Lord's suffering, bleeding, falling under the cross, etc., cetera, um, to, to introduce in between the two stations, this motherly touch is something which I think is very pedagogical, very humane, and, uh, and no wonder people love it. And especially with the, the very famous, you know, traditional melody uh, of the Stabat Mater, which uh, is in, in every good uh, uh, traditional hand missile, even with the notes. I, I had one um, question about um, the the translations of the Stabat Mater because you've um, in in the in the book that we we've, we've uh, recently published, there's essentially is three versions of it. There's the the original Latin, um, then there's a, a more kind of um, a more kind of formal translation, and then the more poetic translation that tends to be used for devotional purposes. Um, so do, do you want to just say a bit about why? why you decided to kind of include all three? Yes, well, the, the very well-known one, at least for um, English believers, uh, um, is the one by uh, an oratorian, Father Edward Caswell. Mm. And um, it, it's beautifully uh, done, you know, with, with uh, 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 balance and, and uh, rhymes, etc. cetera. Um, and it's the one most people would have in mind when they, in fact, pray or sing the Stamat Mata during the Station of the Cross. And, and that's very good, in a way, it's part of our patrimony. However, when I started uh, meditating more uh, in, in details uh, on the Stabat Mater, and I, I, just, um, I just found that very often for the sake of poetic uh, in fluency, uh, the dear father had in fact, um, well, taken liberties a bit with, with the original Latin text. And um, so I just felt it was, um, it was beneficial to the reader uh, in the context of a book, therefore, and not of devotion prayed aloud in a church, but to have a more literal translation. So I, I looked online for, for various things, and uh, finally I just uh, adapted my own, so I hope I haven't made uh, too many mistakes, but certainly it's as, as close to the Latin as possible. So the translation, which is the one uh, commented upon uh, for every stanzas across the book uh, is not meant for devotion. Uh, it is simply as close to the Latin as possible so as to express the nuances with the original uh, you know, author of the Stabat Mater uh, had, had in mind. So it's, it's a working translation, really. Um, so tell us a little bit about what kind of inspired you to, to write this book and a bit how the book itself kind of works, how, how the structure helps you through and, and helps you to meditate on, on the, uh, the Sabbath Mark? If I recall correctly, I, I think it's, uh, it's one of these uh, unexpected fruits of uh, COVID and lockdown, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> I think that many of us, including the clergy, we were a bit um, you know, stuck in our churches and uh, no congregation was allowed to, to come and pray. And uh, like many churches, uh, we developed you know, some online outreach uh, with camera, et cetera. In fact, we had this uh, livemass.net uh, website already in place, but it became uh, uh, even more than before COVID an opportunity to reach out to people. So we would not only have Holy Mass uh, sung very often because we have uh, various clerics and singers available to do that even during lockdown, but we give conferences and uh, I just thought, I think it was during Lent, uh, now a couple of years ago, it seems a, a long time, uh, to simply put in writing thoughts I had about this beautiful hymn of the, the Stabat Mater. Uh, our, our dear people were not able to come into the church to pray the stations because it was uh, locked up, uh, sadly, for, for months. 
And so I thought, well, uh, let us try and pray you know, to, to the Blessed Virgin Mary uh, online through that meditation. So I just opened my old, uh, you know, hand missal and, uh, and tried to, if I dare say, to make sense of it, because one thing is to be moved and to sympathize with uh, uh, the ideas, you know, one after the other. Another thing is to try and find how it works, what is the, the structure. So that's what I tried to explain just earlier with the, the composition of the work, you know, part one, when we are a bit external to, to what is happening, part two, when we um, acknowledge that we are the children of that sorrowful mother, and uh, part three, when very briefly at the end, uh, we, we, we realize that uh, the Lord dying on the cross is our savior. So I, I put that in, in writing and alone in, in our big church, but in front of the camera, uh, and knowing that uh, some people were you know, following this uh, from all over the world, in fact, not only the UK, but in America and elsewhere. So I gave, I think, three um, consecutive talks uh, once a week, uh, from St. Mary's Church, and that was recorded. And then I just thought, well, why not try and make this available, uh, you know, in, in writing? It would be um, it would be a small book, a little pamphlet. And I was absolutely delighted when uh, CTS, you know, accepted to make it available to a wider public. Right. So it's a wonderful text. I mean, and how? What what will people kind of find in the book? How how did you actually kind of go through? The, um, the each stanza and um, what, what will people find there? Because it, it's not, it, it's interesting in the way that it mix both, mixes both the, you know, a, a, quite a kind of um, a scholarly look at it, but at the same time also uh, uh, something that will help in devotion. Yes, I, well, I just take it literally um, and, you know, using the, the, the Latin, but always with the, the translation. So, I explain what literally the author means, like the sorrowful mother was standing is the very first uh, in a verse. And then I give a spiritual explanation uh, of it, uh, which is my own. Obviously, some people may see things a bit differently. That's you know, something I, I offer. Um, I would sometimes look at the liturgy of the church and, uh, and Holy Scriptures, of course, um, uh, you know, to, to enlighten uh, uh, the, the, this poem, you know, with other other sources. So it's it's a private meditation, but very much based on the liturgy of the church and holy scriptures. Um, and uh, my, in my experience, at least, it helped me well understand better that Stabat Mater, which I knew well, you know, for for years, but I had never really uh, gone into it very deeply. And uh, and it's a way of appropriating. This beautiful piece of, of poetry and make it part of our of our relationship with uh, with our blessed lady so it's not scholarly uh it's not purely about exegesis ex uh it's not purely liturgical it's uh, really stanza after stanza a few thoughts a uh, little meditation and then moving to to the next stanza i mean one of the things that you, you mentioned in the text, um, which I, I, I kind of resonates very much with me, is is how uh, the Stabat Mater has been such a kind of rich um, inspiration also for for music over the centuries. Uh, and uh, I suppose um, I, I'd ask, uh, of, uh, you, you mentioned quite a number of, of different settings to music, you know, which, which is your favourite and what would you kind of recommend for people to kind of listen to to get them in into the mood uh, to read a book like this? I suppose that there are you know various emphasis, and I'm no musical expert. I know the Pergolesi uh, one uh, a bit better. I suppose I've I've uh, I've attended you know uh, uh, performances uh, of it, and I I, I like it. Um, I was, in fact, just a couple of years ago, at the time I was writing the, this commentary, I was given a, uh, a more contemporary uh, rendition of it um, by a, a Polish uh, a choir called Jericho. I think you can find it online. It's all there on YouTube. And uh, it's a very, uh, how to put it, a very manly, a very you know, a strong uh, you know, rendition of it with just men and uh, strong voices, uh, almost a bit east and right, mm -hmm. um, but uh, very powerful. You really see 
the sons of Adam, you know, turning towards uh, the, the new Eve and the new Adam and, you know, expressing their, their devotion with a lot of, of strength and, uh, and, and passion. Um, so that's, um, it really shows us that uh, that theme, obviously, which is revelation, redemption, and our Blessed Lady at the Cross uh, is so rich, so deep, that um, you know, not one composer will uh, really say it all. And, uh, and we have even more, more recent ones, uh, you know, if you have composed for, for the, the Stabat Mater. Uh, what I would certainly suggest is that, uh, at least to me, uh, a composer should be uh, somebody who believes. Uh, uh, if he doesn't really understand uh, who Our Lady is in the economy of redemption, if he doesn't have a relationship to her, perhaps there will be you know, nice sounds, but I'm not sure he's going to touch people very much. I would say the same, in fact, about painters or um, Christian artists should be uh, believers. They, it should work for them so that it should work for other people, in my opinion. Yeah, it was. I mean, it's interesting. There, there's a, a famous... Uh, um, documentary that was done by Channel 4 um, with the late Sir Roger Scruton on why beauty matters. And it's interesting that the piece of music that he uses throughout to, to epitomize really beauty in, in and of itself is, is Pergolesi's Stab at Marta. And he keeps coming back to that as, as really a, an example of one of the most beautiful things that kind of humanity has, has ever achieved. Um, and I think I think that comes from both the, the subject matter, but also the fact that it's such a kind of it's a, a piece of like empathetic poetry that we can we can live this experience of our own redemption through the eyes of of somebody who was there. In a sense, it's a very it's extremely kind of modern way of of uh, of of looking at it. Uh, you know, of imagining yourself there. Um, yes. some, something that's worth returning to uh, on a regular basis. I think. We, we see that, don't we, uh, shifting a bit to, um, uh, to painting now, uh, many crucifixions commissioned by you know, rich patrons would have these very patrons depicted you know, at the lower you know, corner of the painting. And uh, obviously it is uh, an uh, anachronism because they were not there at the time. It's, you imagine it's uh, 16th century or 17th, but that's a beautiful reminder that this is not purely a work of art. It is um, an opportunity for sanctification. So to have the one who commissioned the painting depicted there is beautiful. It's like putting himself under the protection of, of the Immaculate. And, and all of us in the Stabat Mater we are invited to do something a bit similar, perhaps, as we, we sing or read any stanza, we are like the one making alive for that, you know, 20 minutes, uh, that beautiful poem, and we, we enter into the story. Great. Well, I think that's, that's a wonderful place to end. Um, and I, I hope that we, uh, in, in our own small way, uh, contribute to uh, making this, uh, this wonderful um, product of the, the Franciscan genius um, for, for making things kind of concrete and, and uh, allowing us to, to really kind of be there, uh, continue for, for many years, uh, uh, for, for many years into the future. So thank you, Father Aman, for, for your work. Thank you very much for uh, writing this book. If, if you could give us and our listeners a, a blessing, and we'll finish there. Delicio de Omnipotentis, Patris et Filius Petrus, Sancti de Genes Superbos, et Mane et Semper. Amen. Let's Amen. gather to the Blessed Virgin Mary. She's depicted behind me, as you see, and say no doubt she will be uh, in, uh, supporting and uh, favoring uh, the great apostolate of CTS. So thank you very much. Thank you. God bless.